I'm going to take the opportunity now to introduce to you Mr. Jeremiah Schnee, founder and president of the Wealth and Values Initiative and the Dolphin Foundation. Mr. Schnee. Good morning, everybody. I want to start off by thanking the American Veterans Center for the spectacular series of events and for their wonderful service to our country. I also am so impressed with the quality of the young people here today, these young, high-potential military leaders inspire confidence in me as a father of four with three grandkids in terms of the future of my kids and grandkids in this country. <clears throat> I also am very appreciative of a special VIP group of the Wealth and Values Initiative and Dolphin Foundation that are here today having come from across the country. So you've no doubt seen uh, the formal side of Peter Cuneo in his bio in your program. Um, as a leading turnaround expert in this country, if you go to Forbes.com, they, they say he's top 10 up there with Steve Jobs and others. Um, and his most notable turnaround, I might add, was Marvel Entertainment, which he took out of bankruptcy and sold to Disney nine years later for $4.5 billion. Anybody here a fan of Marvel? All right, every hand. <clears throat> but I want to share very briefly a little bit more on the personal side having had the pleasure and honor of working with Peter, both as a partner and as a friend for over seven years. Peter is a patriot, having served on the USS Strauss Vietnam conflict as a surface warfare officer, command duty officer, fleet officer of the deck, and air intercept controller, after which he pivoted and completed Harvard Business School, um, and having emerged from Harvard Business School, having gone to Alfred University, ultimately became chairman of the board of Alfred University um, and received an honorary degree there. So service to the country, business leadership, uh, academic leadership, Peter's also a patriarch. So he's been married for 49 years to a, his lovely bride, Maris, with whom I've had the opportunity to work philanthropically. Maris uh, runs that part of the family office. And Peter did found what we call a family office after exiting Marvel, which is intergenerational wealth in which generations collaborate together, and that's the work of the Wealth and Values Initiative. We work with legacy families. And we're doing a lot philanthropically, both for veterans, which is 50% of the Dolphin Foundation, as well as for the area that we call sports for good, when an athlete pivots, pivots toward give back. And our mission is to inspire wealth and power to do just that, pivot toward give back. So all of those dimensions, Hard to imagine one person has done them. Peter's done them wonderfully. And the most important takeaway, he walks the talk. So without further ado, my friend and partner, Peter Cuny. Well, thank you all very much. Can you hear me OK? Great. So I saw the, all those hands go up from Marvel. Now I have to change my entire presentation uh, because I, I have the feeling we want to talk more about Marvel than anything else. Uh, I will talk a little bit about Marvel. 
Uh, and I have changed my presentation, although not so much for the hands this morning, but because I've been very, very inspired the last couple of days sitting in on almost all the sessions. And there are certain themes that came out of those sessions, I think, that I think I can also help reinforce. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I hope every speaker, as you might imagine, and I've been doing these kinds of things for 20 years, <clears throat> wants to leave something behind, something that the audience will remember no matter what, just one thing. If you can do that, you've, you've been very successful. So I will try to do that with all of you today. So think of this presentation not as a, as a group presentation, but actually simply as a fireside chat. I want to speak to each of you individually, at least spiritually, if not in actual practice. Um, and so uh, uh, I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here. And again, I think uh, I'm always tremendously turned on when I can speak to people that are younger than I. You know, we get to a certain age and we, we older people sh uh, basically get a lot of our energy fr from younger people. And uh, seeing the bright lights in our, in our future, which includes, I think, all of you in the room today. The uh, task that I was assigned, my tasking assignment, was to talk, try to talk about some of the leadership lessons that I learned in the, in the military and that I have subsequently used in civilian life. And I'm gonna do that today and I will uh, uh, use Marvel as a, a model in some cases for, for things that I learned in the military but were able to apply uh, in the future. Um, I'm wearing two pins today. I think they're important. The pin on my left lapel is the pin, is the pin of the National Archives. I have been on the board of the National Ar Archives Foundation for eight years. Uh, I, we are having this meeting here today by pure coincidence, but I've sat in your seats for a long time and seen scores of people up here at the podium presenting, so for me it's kind of fun to do a little reversal today and be up here. The National Archives is in some ways America's best kept secret. The National Archives keeps the records of all the departments of the government from the beginning. We have 16 billion documents. Six billion are digital. But we have 10 billion documents that are not digital. We have the largest collection of antique maps, largest collection of film, and I think it's 48 million photographs in the archives. We talked earlier today, I think, uh, 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 about uh, the importance of education and le learning history. And I always loved history growing up, and it's one of the reasons I went into mil military. I'll talk a little about that. It's also the reason that I'm on the board of the archives, because I love history. I do believe that past is prologue that by studying history, we can all increase our wisdom. Human nature being what it is, it tends to repeat itself. The trappings may be different, the situations may be different, but it will be very important for you to be successful in the future to understand human nature. Whether you're a junior officer or uh, uh, a, a star rank, Reading people is very, very important. I learned a lot of that in the Navy, and I've used it successfully, I think, in civilian life as well. Um, the archives is, as I said, America's best kept secret. You are sitting a couple of floors down underneath the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and a copy of the Magna Carta, which is the basis for all English law. And I do, so someone said, please get up there and take a look while you're here. Um, it's, it's truly a, a, an amazing experience to see those documents. We also, the archives also oversees uh, all 14 presidential libraries. So for someone like me who loves history, this is a, this is a gold mine, if you will, a great place. It's, it's a ho hollowed, a sacred place for me, and, and it should be for all Americans. And by the way, the archives are, open to all Americans, with the exception of some confidential documents, obviously. All Americans can come here and take advantage. 
The pin on my right lapel is actually also from the archives. We on the foundation raise money to do special exhibits that will first be here, and the exhibit that's here to, uh, presently is exist, the exhibit on the 19th Amendment, the 100th anniversary of women getting the vote, women's suffrage. And again, if you're going to be here, I think you'd learn a lot about it. Uh, the plight of women historically in our country. And I, I'd uh, recommend to you that, that you go and try to get through that exhibit, male or female. I think you'll learn a great deal. But several years ago, we did the, the uh, 50th anniversary of, this, of the uh, Vietnam War, of which I'm a veteran. And uh, the four of us on the board that were Vietnam veterans got this pin. And I thought I would wear it just for that year. But frankly, I wear it all the time now. And I don't think I'll ever take it off. But again, this all ties together under, under this rooftop. So I think it's really super moving, frankly, for me to be here today. I want to talk a little bit about um, my service. Why did I go in the Navy in the first place? Um, I was. Uh, uh, from a Navy family. My father was a Navy officer in South Pacific. And in the Korean War, he was ordnance officer on the USS Valley Forge during Korea. My father loved the Navy. He wanted to stay in. Even though he was way past the age when Vietnam came, he actually wrote a letter to uh, the Navy trying to get them to call him back up, even though he was retired. Uh, and that was typical of my father. By the way, the archives has, in St. Louis, the records of 100 million Americans who have served in the military from World War I forward. In this building, we have the records, all the other military records, of all the Americans that served from the Revolutionary War uh, to just prior to World War I. And I have actually gotten my father's uh, records from St. Louis, and I learned a great deal about my father I never knew. My father had a very difficult time with PTSD, and he died young because of it. And uh, to a certain degree, as a young kid, I could never understand why uh, he was uh, so unhappy. He was a lieutenant in New York si Fire Department as well. Uh, my uncle, Uncle Roy, he's 96, is one of my heroes today, still living. He landed at Leyte Gulf with MacArthur. Leyte Gulf was the largest naval engagement in history. For those, for those of you who want to learn a little bit about history, I'm going to talk about one aspect of that in a little bit. He also served, uh, my uncle also served in the Navy uh, during the Korean War. So growing up, this was part of my life. Um, and uh, I loved history. And I read a lot of military history and was moved by it, watched a lot of the old films. I thought I was John Wayne to a certain degree in many of these films and, uh, and so on. So I, I might mention a few of them to you and, and, and you might actually want to have the same experience that, that I've had, maybe one for each service. So in the Air Force, I think what really inspired me was a film that I would consider to be, and I'm in the film business as you all know, perhaps the greatest film on military leadership ever made. And the film was actually made in 1948, nominated for the Academy Award, won several awards, not Best Picture, runner-up for Best Picture. And if you're all wondering, what could that film be? It's actually a film called 12 O'Clock High, scar uh, starring Gregory Peck. I think anyone sitting here who's involved with the Air Force, either as a student or as an act, uh, active duty officer or, or retired, they don't know the film, you have to see it. It is the true story of the Americans taking on daylight bombing in uh, World War II over Europe, flying out of England. And it is a turnaround story. And of course, I've made my career doing turnarounds. Marvel is just one of seven that I've completed, taking on difficult assignments when things were pretty chaotic financially culturally and otherwise in companies. So this is a turnaround film. A, a, a particular squadron is not doing well. Gregory Peck is asked 
uh, by his commander to take over the squadron and fix it. I really recommend it all to you. You may think 1948, black and white, how good can it be? It is classic. It is classic. 12 o'clock high, Gregory Peck. I'm actually requesting that all of you try to see the film. I often use it in my, I do a lot of presentations on leadership, and I often will uh, use the film to start things off. Um, for the Marine Corps, actually you might say I'm going to talk about Iwo Jima. Iwo Jima is considered the Marine Corps' finest hour. We certainly have a wonderful uh, memorial here in Washington. But I have a slightly different opinion. For me, in all my readings, the Marine Corps' greatest moment may be the Chosan Reservoir in North Korea. For those of you, again, who are thinking about the Marine Corps or anyone else, you must read the story. It is a Korean War. We have driven the North Koreans back, basically, to the Chinese border. The Chinese decide, it's winter, Chinese decide to enter the war and they send uh, millions of uh, soldiers against us in the north. The Marines are occupying the area around the Chosan Reservoir. It is minus 30 degrees. Human waves of Chinese come at the Marines. It's 10 to 1. 10 to 1. Now, one of the reasons people maybe don't associate this as a great moment is because this initiated a strategic withdrawal by the Marines. But they had to fight their way out from being surrounded 10 to 1 in minus 30 degrees. I believe this may be the battle in which the Marines earned more medals of honor than any other single battle uh, in their history. I'm not sure of that, but there's certainly many of them. And they didn't leave anyone behind. There's lots of good books about this, which once again I would, I would uh, offer to you. I think for the Army, for me it's of course Normandy, and I was privileged to make my first visit to Normandy just three weeks ago. And uh, we all know this is the 75th anniversary of Normandy, and I was very, very moved. Um, there are 9,900 Americans buried in the cemetery, and if you go, you must visit Pont Hoc. Pont Hoc is the beach, if you can call it a beach, where the chalk cliffs go straight up. And the rangers came in and basically shot up grappling hooks and climbed up uh, uh, against the Germans, literally on top of them. Germans actually didn't defend Pont Hoc with inventory, many in infantry, because they considered it basically impregnable. No one could make it up the cliffs, but the rangers did. And the rangers made it in, and they fought their way inland for about a mile and took positions. Uh, the Germans counterattacked. The, the, the uh, rangers held for two days. They had no food, and they had very little ammunition. When they were finally relieved, out of 220 rangers, there were only a hundred left. Amazing moment. I recommend uh, Normandy to everybody. If I sound a little uh, emotional, I am. I think um, for the Navy, and this is one of the reasons I was in destroyers and chose to be in destroyers. I was lucky if you had grades well enough in officer candidate school, you got to pick your assignment, and I picked destroyers in the Pacific. And one of the reasons is the battle off Samar. Again, for the midshipmen who are here, go look it up. Uh, it's the essence of what a surface warfare officer is. This is part of the Battle of Leyte Gulf. Without getting into too much detail, a situation occurred in which the uh, Japanese fleet, which included the greatest battleship ever built, was undetected uh, coming against the uh, beaches where we had landed uh, from the north. Only guarding the beaches basically at that point were four destroyers and destroyer escorts and a bunch of jeep carriers and, the, and basically these, the, the uh, Japanese fleet attacked um, un, basically undetected. 
This is often called the uh, Battle of the Small Boys because the commander of that task force ordered these four destroyers to immediately go right at the uh, Japanese, which then were about 12 miles away. But of course, their guns had ranges well over 12 miles. Four destroyers went right, basically, then destroyer escorts went at the Japanese, uh, firing their little five-inch guns, uh, which really had very little impact, and launching torpedoes. Four were sunk. They all knew they were going to die. One was heavily damaged and, and survived. Uh, the planes from the Jeep carriers also attacked like bees. Uh, and they had, in some cases, absolutely no armament, no, no ammunition. They just flew to provide the sense that there was more of them attacking than there were. And amazingly, the Japanese fleet retreated. And I always remember that story in, uh, of these destroyers going basically f at flank speed directly against the enemy, knowing they wouldn't survive. So I was always turned on by these stories. And so when the Vietnam War came, there was no question that I was going to go in. Um, I did an officer candidate school at Newport, Rhode Island, and in four months, I was an officer. In those days, and it's probably true, uh, we got reserve, reserve commissions. Uh, of course, very different from the, uh, uh, the, the, the graduates of Annapolis and NROTC that got regular commissions. So my, my term, term of service was going to be three years. And I did that on the, uh, on the USS Joseph Strauss call sign Fleet Fox. And uh, rare to be on the same ship for three years, but I was. I was first damage control assistant and then comm officer. Uh, and uh, fleet officer of the deck, et cetera, et cetera. I love driving a ship. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later on. The thing I remember the most, though, is the tremendous amount of responsibility that young officers got in the military at that time. And I think it is still true today. All of you will get uh, great responsibilities for your age. And if you use that properly, you, you can uh, uh, bring great credit to yourself and to your accomplishments. Very, very important. We are lacking in leadership today in this country. I think we all know that. I personally have the opinion that there are less successful good leaders in our country than ever in our history. And I base that on, on my readings of history and my own personal experience. Let's see if we can work this. So I would ask you, I should have asked you before I put this up, to uh, define what you think successful leadership is. I think it's actually very simple, and this is, this is my definition. You notice I mentioned positive goal. There have been lots of leaders in the world that were leaders, but not successful. And in a way, this is very simplistic, but I think it tells a story. Um, for many years, I've been doing talks around the world. Sometimes they take four hours. Sometimes I talk for an hour and there are three hours of Q&A because the subject of leadership is so interesting to people. Um, a little bit of history. This started almost 20 years ago when I was CEO of Marvel and I was asked to give a speech on leadership uh, to Harvard Business School, my, my alma mater. And, um, I had a long flight to Hong Kong. Of course, we, we did a lot of business uh, making products in China. And uh, I just started writing, what am I going to say about leadership? And something happened. It was like eight or nine hours straight. I just couldn't stop. It was one of those moments, thinking my whole life through, totally quiet. And at that time, I came up with 28, what I'm calling essential uh, for successful leadership. Um, and. Um, Today it's 32, so in the past 19 or 20 years, I've added four. Um, but there are a couple of things that I think are worth mentioning. Um, I do think these are useful, by the way, to anybody. I don't care if you're in the military. I don't care if you're in business. Uh, you can be a nonprofit. You can be heading a civic organization. You can be the president of the PTA in your town. You can be uh, heading up the Sunday school in your church. 
All of these are fundamental. And they would work for everybody. I don't care what your background is, what your age is, whether you have money or not, what your sexual orientation is, what your color is, what your ethnic group is, what your gender is, it doesn't matter. I think this, these are our universal principles. Um, you know, they, they, many of them I think is very important to say have come from my mistakes. I often say that I, uh, I remember every gory detail of my mistakes, but I, I remember very little about my successes. And it's true. So I've tried to learn from them. And one of the great things about great leaders is they always learn from their mistakes. And we can talk a little bit more about that. They're always very honest about what works and what doesn't work. And they're always trying to improve. This is not a complete list. It's my list. If you were tasked with doing your own list, it might be different. It might include some of these things, probably would but might include some others. So I don't pretend that this is uh, the end all at all. These are written, however, not from 40,000 feet, but from right on the, right on the ground. Uh, you can get uh, talks. You can re read some books by consultants. You can um, go to a class in, in school. And they talk about leadership often from 40,000 feet. Someone must have vision. A leader has vision. Well, that's fine. You can actually have vision and be a terrible leader, by the way. That's just one example of what. So I wrote, wrote these for somebody who was going to have to lead people every day, every day, and motivate them accordingly. Um, I also think that you might want to get a, a, this list. I'm not going to show the whole list in the interest of time. However, uh, you know, the organization, the American Vets, Center has the list, and they will be happy to provide the full list to you. They are very simple. They take two pages. They are one or two sentences each. I use this to grade myself on a regular basis, even after all these years. And I've had people who I've given this to many, many, 10 years ago, call me up and say they still use the list. But if you're going to use the list, you have to be honest with yourself. Don't have to share it with anyone else. Think about the things on the list you're good at. Think about the things that you're not good at and try to improve them. I'm sure you will be able to improve them. What I'm going to do now is select a couple of these uh, and take you through them. and. Um, talk about some experiences I had in the Navy and also uh, in civilian life in leadership. The first part of what I do is, uh, in these essentials is what I consider fundamentals. And what I mean by fundamentals is actually very simply things that we all know are true. You will look at this first group of fundamentals and probably say, well, I know that. I get that. But in my experience, not many people actually practice them. So that's why they're here. So I'd like to talk about number two for a minute, which is not coming up correctly for some reason, but let's see if it, OK. OK, good. Um, and this one is simply tell people wh what you really think. Just talk about simply being honest and admit your mistakes. The year is 1968. I am a brand new ensign on the Strauss. I'm on board about two weeks. We are in uh, the Tonkin Gulf. The mission we're on is called plane guarding. At that time, uh, it may be different today because this is 50 years ago, but basically when aircraft carriers launched or recovered aircraft, they wanted a destroyer one nautical mile in front and another one one more nautical mile in trail, simply because if someone went in the water, you know, you hopefully were able to, to pick up the pilots. Um, in the Navy at that time, the worst time for Airedales flying off the carriers was actually landing. Now, it was also true, and it's very little known, that um, the Navy pilots flying against the North had a 50% chance of being hit during their tour, which was typically six months on station. 
they may make it back to the carrier, not shot down necessarily. But we often had planes going feet wet, getting back over the water and wanting to get back on the carrier. So the role of the destroyers was very important. The Navy launched uh, and recovered aircraft at night. You couldn't tell the difference. They flew a lot of night missions. It is the mid-watch. That's the watch from mid midnight to, uh, to four in the morning. And I am a junior officer. And the captain says to me, all Cuneo, all I want you to do is stand here and observe. You don't have to do anything. We would be on what we call the gun line in the war zone for 30 days at a time, and then take three or four days of R&R &R in some port. The captain of the ship was on the bridge the entire time, except when he had to take, her, take care of certain health duties. He slept in his chair because there was action all the time. And the captain would typically get, as you might imagine, very, very tired and exhausted. It is now 2 o'clock in the morning. We receive an order from the carrier, call sign Tip Top. Fleet Fox Tip Top takes station and for one mile in trail. And of course, they give you the carriers turning into the wind at flank speed, which is for them is about the equivalent of uh, 35 miles an hour. Giant ship doing 35 miles an hour over the water is unbelievable uh, to recover and, and possibly launch aircraft. Um, when you're at night, you float around at random. You don't know where the other destroyer is or the carrier, simply because you, 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 you're a darkened ship. And so uh, you, you have some idea on, on surface search radar where people are, but basically it's very quiet and you're just floating around waiting. And we received the order. And the officer of the deck was a Mustang, a former enlisted man, and, and superb, I have to say, looking back, superb officer. Again, for those of you that are not in the Navy, the captain is not the one giving orders to the engine order to telegraph for speed or uh, to the helm for, for, for uh, course. It's the officer of the deck. And the officer of the deck was this Mustang, and he quickly did a calculation, a relative motion cal calculation. We're here, the carrier is there, the carrier is turning to this course at this speed. We need to get one mile behind. How do we do it? And uh, gives orders to them. The captain, who had been groggy, if not asleep in his chair, wakes up. What? Got to go what? We're done? I'm only halfway through. <laughs> OK. So the, uh, I'll finish this story then and we'll move on. The, uh, the captain wakes up, does a calculation, countermands the OD's orders. And I could tell something is wrong. And at this point, I'm starting to wonder if I made a career, <laughs> uh, uh, made a bad career decision. About one minute later, we're about to cut the other destroyer in half. Captain Gibbs, hard rudder. We managed the only time in my Navy career I ever heard hard rudder. And, uh, uh, and basically, we managed very close aboard to avoid the other ship. Next morning, the ship is buzzing with what, the, uh, what had happened. The ship is like a little tight community. Everybody knows everything. And the question was, can we trust this captain? Will he get us killed? Is there something wrong with the captain? And the captain did something extraordinary. He called a meeting of all the officers. And he sat at the head of the table and said, last night there was an incident. I made a mistake. I want to go through what happened and thoroughly analyze it so it never happens again. And I could see in the next hour how the mood in the, in the room changed from, can we trust this captain, to we, we're, we're willing to die for him. It was that dramatic. So I always have, have learned and lived about, about this issue of admitting mistakes. In the civilian life, I've had no problem admitting my mistakes when something had to be fixed. And as a CEO, in turnaround situations where people can lose their jobs next week, where the company can go under because it's, it's bankrupt, you have to make a lot of decisions very quickly, in some cases with incomplete information. You have to do it. And some will be mistakes, and I've always known that. 
And I've always told my organizations, I will make some mistakes, but we will fix them. That's what matters. Uh, so it looks like uh, I'm getting pushed away. Uh, I'll be out in the uh, hallway, uh, you know, if anyone wants to hear the rest of my presentation. But I want to thank you all very much, and uh, good luck to all of you.